not for me. I'm all grown up, your job is done, and it's time you set me free. I've heard they're hiring out west to work a rancher spread or carry the mail on the Pony Express. That's what the papers said. from the Outlaw Trail. Um, I'm Marcy Broyhill from Dakota City, Nebraska, and I'm here with my lovely sister. I'm Teresa from, now I am from Lone Oak, Arkansas, which is uh, 20 minutes east of Little Rock. It's like in, what, 10 hour drive? At least. <laughs> I think she drives faster than I do. <laughs> and down here, uh, helping us with the uh, uh, computer is my husband Kent. If I don't introduce him, I have to go. Yes. 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 I have to go in a pair of socks. So there you go. <laughs> so um, here, our story is about tangled trails, our journeys. No matter who we are, 
Our life journey is a tangled trail where we cross other people's trails, and sometimes those trails are um, complicated. Maybe they're fun, but sometimes they're complicated. And that's what we're gonna kind of talk to you about some people and their trails throughout life. And we're kind of, kind of, we're going, we're going to kind of focus on the Western trails that people took. And um, the Western movement during the eight, mid 1850s, people out West were 90, 80 to 90% men. And their trails were certainly complicated. And women, they would go, but they usually went as wives or daughters or sisters or children, of course. But some of them did go independently and to be with missionaries or teachers or, and it's my understanding, 12 to 15% of the women came to do homesteading. So um, that's pretty tough. So, but some people were fleeing their past. And um, that was a tangled trail. So I'm going to tell you a story about a lady who came to Mullen, Nebraska. Back in a time when cattle outnumbered people, and that's still true today. <laughs> Mullen, Nebraska is out in Hooker County, and it is the only town in that county. Wow. <clears throat> It was a hot Nebraska day in 1888 when Rose arrived in Mullen with the Cowtown's weekly freight. When the Teamster stopped his wagon at the only dry goods store, Rose climbed down from her perch on top and headed to the door. Now the folks in town took notice of this new and pretty face. What was this woman doing in their town, in this place? Yes, this windblown lady Stirred up rumors, gossip all around. What on earth would bring her to this far-flung cattle town? Now, Rose detected questions when she looked into their eyes, and she felt their gaze upon her back, and she knew what they surmised. But this woman had no time for any gossip monger game. Pursued by past adversity, employment was her aim. This able woman stepped with self-reliance up and down the street, politely telling those she had the opportunity to meet. I have skills to sew and cook and cipher numbers as a clerk. I'll wash your clothes, I'll scrub your floors. I'm no stranger to hard work. But the only job in this cow town was at Fred Troop's saloon, the newest venture in the county. It was called the Thirsty Moon. This revelation was a letdown, yet she had to hold her tongue. Rose had to take this lowly job until she found a better one because Rose was in a fiscal strait. She had no means to relocate. Rose had to work this temporary, secondary card of fate. So, Fred, so Rose told Frederick Troop she would work his rooster coop. But Rose spoke clear and Rose spoke plain. She was not an upstairs Jane. <coughs> Rose put a smile upon her face, tucked the gun in bodice lace. She greeted all the clientele, not the type to hear than tell. This lady's tactics did affect an attitude of due respect. Men came to the thirsty moon to dwell beside the newest barroom bell. One day a gambling man strolled in. His mood was dark and his face was grim. His eyes perused around the place and then he snickered when he found her face. Greetings, my Sally Rose McFall. I tracked you down to this locale. You're looking pretty, yes siree, but now you need to come with me. It's time we make our way to Denver. Their tables flow with gold and silver. So pack your bag, it's time to go. But Rose stood firm. Rose said, no. For three long years I've worked for you. Your hand is heavy. Your words are blue. No matter what you say or do, I will never go with you. Then she pulled her gun from bodice lace and aimed it at the gambler's face. Her response caused great surprise to his ears, to his eyes. The mo gambler man was mortified that his response would be denied. When did 
did she become so bold? His blood grew hot and his eyes grew cold. Then he spied the men at hand. This crusty lot would understand. So he proceeded to explain the reason she was his domain. Men, let me share the history of this here gal from Tennessee. She made the choice to work for me, a fancy gal she chose to be. I taught her charm, I taught her dance, I taught her cards, the game of chance. I bought her shoes and fancy threads. Oh, Sally Rose turned many heads. We worked the tables night and day. I held the card that oh, she made the play. Her teasing looks made folk a string. Yes, Sally Rose made gambling pay. I trained and groomed her stylishly. She's a beauty, you can see. Logic tells me you'll agree. This working gal belongs to me. Then he grabbed her arm, hoping to disarm. The gun just went off above their heads. From the back room, in came Fred. You take your hands off my sweet rose or you will earn a broken nose. You get your hide right out this door. You ain't welcome here no more. The gambler paused and looked around. No endorsements to be found. He scowled, he cursed, he took his leave. His Sally McBell was not retrieved. Trembling, Rose turned white, amazed that she survived the fight. Reviewing what had just occurred, she left the room without a word. Gossip raised for miles around, distraught this lady's state house bound. Her past could never be erased. Embarrassed, Rose endured disgrace. Compassion came from her boss, Fred. Rose, my dear, lift up your head. We all conceal our past mistakes. Reviewing mine keeps me awake. Be brave, go out and face the day. It's time to put your past away. Somewhere, someone needs a lift. Kind-hearted words will be your gift. Rose contemplated Fred's advice. She knew that she must pay the price. So she began a strategy. Benevolence would be her key. Rose knocked on doors of deprivation, caring for the population. This lady's newly found vocation eased past views of condemnation. Now Fred, he was smitten in love with Rose. He found his courage to propose. Rose said, yes, she did accept. They, she loved the Fred Troop. They shared respect. Now this lady of redeeming fame rose above her past to shame. For miles around, folks did claim Rose was the essence of her name. Some years ago, um, I went with mom and we were out by the Chimney Rock or someplace out west, bought a series of books and they were a one page story. And one of the stories was about a lady who, uh, about her trip to Oregon. And I read it and I thought, okay, they went and they got married and they lived happily ever after. And I thought, well, there's something missing there. And so I thought about that story and I wrote this song and it's kind of based on my own thinking of what uh, they must have been thinking and the hardship of leaving and not not going or or going so here we go oh today i actually bought some backtracks with me when i go to the studio and uh, have them arrange these songs for me it's so much fun to have marcy play but i rarely get to use the backtracks and so today i thought i would So very young, the 
daddy told me no. He said I couldn't go. But my brother. Today is original material, except uh, for just a teeny bit at the end. But Terry wrote those songs, and I've written these stories. So, um, I was in um, Valentine, Nebraska, one time, driving through, and I went to their museum. And on the wall, there was a picture of a man in a wedding. It was Charlie Bachelor. And I thought, oh, Bachelor. Okay, well, I changed his name to Andrew. <laughs> After five hard years, his homestead filing was complete and done. Andrew Bachelor, well, he reckoned he could afford, reckoned he was tired of being one. There you go. He was tired of being a bachelor. During those long, lonely years, he also gained good livestock, barn, and house. Andrew figured he could afford the comfort of a spouse. But it was clear to Andrew on his monthly business trips to town Kelly Colfer Corton in these parts was rarely found. He heard of men attaining wife, requesting them by mail. Oh, his neighbors kind of warned him. That sort of venture often fails. Yeah, sure was a, a risky business, but a courtship chance at least. So he sent a basic letter to his childhood church back east. He wrote, my name is Andrew Bachelor. I'm 26 years old. I'm a rancher from Nebraska where the weather's always cold. I'm an honest Christian man. I seek an honest Christian wife. It's best if she can cook and sew and live the country life. Come make my house our home. I'll be good and true. If you have some interest, I'll send railroad fare to you. It took three long months till one long letter answered Andrew's invitation. He was surprised, excited, all of a sudden, full of anticipation. Would his efforts for a bride bring benefit or regret instead? His heart was beating, his hands were shaking as he opened the letter and read. My name is Anna Blessing. I found your letter at my church. I'm responding to your situation of a wifely search. 
Uh, I bought the railroad ticket on my own to sidestep obligation. I'm scheduled to arrive June 7th at your local depot station. I'll wear a yellow bonnet, making me an easy find. I have some extra parcels. I'm hoping you don't mind. The day arrived. Andrew waited at the station without knowing if this lady would appear or simply forego showing. The train pulled in. People disembarked the rail cars one by one. Andrew's eyes were searching for the bonnet colored like the sun. He took note but did not see any woman traveling alone. Perplexed, perhaps relieved, he was about to head back home. That's when he saw the yellow bonnet. But something was awry. That lady was attending two small children. Andrew wondered why. As she was talking to the porter, Andrew contemplated flight. But his conscience made him stay. He kept the threesome in his sight, because if this trio was his correspondent's consequence, he could not forsake them there. His greeting must commence. Ma'am? Uh, my name is Andrew Bachelor. Would you by chance be Anna Blessing? These two handsome children must be yours. I'm just a guessing. Yes, Mr. Bachelor, I'm the woman that you seek. This is Grace and Ben. Can we find a private place to speak? Anna acknowledged. I wondered if you'd come and meet me here today. I knew the sight of Ben and Grace might cause your walk away. I am the aunt of these two children. I am their only kin. If you approve of me, you must approve of them. I'll be frank and state the issues where I take a stand. I'll not accept foul language or endure a heavy hand. I know we're more than you expected. If you decline, I understand I'm not uh, desperate for a husband. But perhaps you are that man. I'm looking to improve our lives and make this place our home. I'm a first-rate cook and seamstress. We can make it on our own. Well, Andrew did a lot of thinking when they all took a walk. He weighed the pros and cons, and then he listened to them talk. Then Andrew took them to the diner where they shared a midday meal. That's where they furthered their discussion of this pending family deal. Grace and Ben were children of her brother. Since their parents died last year, Rose, Anna had taken the role of mother. Andrew was impressed with Anna's love for children not her own. He had no doubt this woman's grit and skill could make their house his a home. But could this pretty woman endure hardship with a cheerful spirit? He liked the way she spoke her mind. At least he would not have to read it. Well, the next day, Anna wore a golden wedding band. All four were headed to their home across the prairie to their land. Anna, Grace, and Ben adapted to the prairie life and style. Husband, wife, and children, all needs were satisfied. This couple was a well-matched team to work the ranching west. They added friendships, to livestock, land, and children to their family nest. Even though their Romance was not ignited with romantic passion. Their love evolved with compromise, respect, and deeds of thoughtful action. Throughout his years of marriage, Andrew often found himself reflecting how his male order bride was indeed his finest bachelor blessing. Thank you. Many of the pictures up here are Solomon Butcher, who went through Nebraska taking photographs of families. And you'll notice what did they put, what was important to them? Their team and the sewing machine. <laughs> so since we're talking about brides and marriage, I've got a song called The Mail Order Bride. This is one of the latest ones that I have uh, uh, recorded and it's not on any CD just yet. She 
She took a chance and signed a promise and sent it in the mail to a cowboy in Wyoming who worked the cattle trail. With precious few belongings, she rode the westbound stage to meet the man in Cheyenne to whom she was engaged. Just a plain girl from the city who felt guilty that she lied. Her tarnished reputation this lady chose to hide. And she prayed he'd find her pretty and would like her auburn hair. A rose barrette and her blue church dress was the best she had to wear. Male or bride, who was she fooling? He had asked her to come, not knowing what she'd done. There's a chance they won't marry as they planned. When he meets her in Cheyenne, just a fool kind of couple who fudged some on the truth. His life was rough and empty, and his ways have been uncouth. A gruffical cowboy who worked hard for his pay, he knew their life would have some strife if she'd decide to stay. He was waiting on the boardwalk when the coach rolled into town. He mustered up his courage to help the lady down. He was smitten by her beauty when he looked into her eyes. He was a nervous wreck when they finally met. He was filled with butterflies. A male or bride, what was he doing? A male or bride, who was he fooling? He had asked her to come, but his hope might come undone. There's a chance she won't marry as they planned. When she meets him in Cheyenne, he tipped his hat politely and he asked her, would you be the lady from St. Louis who came to marry me? Treated her to dinner, then revealed the cold hard facts. He was ashamed, and he wouldn't blame her for going back. But she whispered, I'll take a chance on you. If you take a chance on me. If you like what you see and you want it to be, won't you take a chance on me? A male or a bride, what was she doing? A male or a bride, who was he fooling? But they opened up their hearts, took a chance for a new start, and their wedding bells were Siouxland, and um, you probably, some of you probably already know this Tangled Trail. Come listen to my tale of brothers, a scenario as ancient as time, when ventured the straight and narrow, the other a road of crime. They echoed words from the Bible of brothers Abel and Cain, one promoted law and order, the other corruption and pain. At the age of 16, Vincenzo joined a traveling circus show. 
but the city is family and home, escaping the streets below. For a decade, there was no contact between Vincenzo and his kin. Was he alive? Was he dead? Living in grace or sin? In time, he joined the army and served in World War I, then hopped the train and headed west. His military service was done. He crossed the mighty, muddy mo into Nebraska land, changed his name to Richard J. Hart, and took a lawman's stand. He ventured to White. Hmm, I'm, I'm having a little brain burn. He tracked gamblers and bootleggers throughout the Nebraska hills, apprehending those in possession, shutting down for holes and still. Yet, he fancied, I'm good. He fancied rodeo. He could handle a horse, a rope, and bull ride. He was an excellent marksman with a horse the pearl handle at each side. Yet Tuca never discussed his past or his aunt, family's ancestry. Certain aspects of his life were shrouded in mystery. But then some folks heard, mis heard rumors. It was hard for them to perceive how some things fell so far from the mark. What card was up his sleeve? Some folks say he was obsessed, that he liked to make a show. But when you wear a star, you are defined as friend or foe. Yet Hart was more than just a lawman. He had four boys and a wife. Three sons served in World War II, where one laid down his life. Meanwhile, back in the city, Brother Alphonse worked the dark side of the street, learned the trade of murder, greed, and deceit. Now we cannot choose our bloodline, but we can determine our personal track. There are times to sever relations when dealings are sinister and black. When straddling conflicting worlds, you may find yourself alone. Such was the draw of Tugan Hart, the brother of Al Capone. And um, most of you are aware that Tugan Hart Made, uh, spent most of his adult life in the Homer, Nebraska area. And uh, that's where he raised his sons. And uh, he had family there for up till about 10 years ago. And they have all gone. My husband at one time was in a band. He was a drummer <laughs> before I knew him. Um, and he was in a band called Jagged Edge. And one of the musicians was Jeff Hart, which would have been Al Capone's nephew. So anyway, um, just a quick little commercial here. If you're interested in Terry's um, patriotic show, you should check that out. She has a song, uh, that heart songs that will just pinch your heart. Um, one is four stars, and that's the American Legion flag. And she also, I'm bragging you up here, she also has a song uh, dedicated to the Korean vets. Maybe some of you heard that. And that is her CD up there. And then I have a book, Nebraska's Outlaw Trails, and my newest book should be delivered tomorrow, this week. And uh, Gloria, is the cover okay? That's fine. <laughs> Marcy does so much memorization. All her stuff is memorized, and it's just incredible, I think, that, that she does that. Next up we have... Yeah, she has all kinds of poems that she does. Well, uh, we took a trip, Marcy, uh, found out that they were having this festival up in Northfield, um, Minnesota, and it was called the Defeat of Jesse James Day, and we went up there. I had written a song about Jesse James, and then when we got up there, the song was already recorded, and I got up there, and you know, some of the internet stuff wasn't true. 
So I had to go fix my song and then go back to the studio and get it right. We do enjoy playing this song and then we've, we've got a few words to say afterwards. There rode a band of outlaws from the Civil War. They were reckless, they were brutal, vicious and hardcore. This was the deadly king of Frank and Jesse James. Wherever they would go, trouble always came. Ooh, 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 trouble's coming. But when trouble came to Northfield, they got a big surprise. The beginning of the end of Jesse and the guys. Three went in for money, Charlie, Bob, and Frank. Then someone hollered out, then Robin the bank. Men grabbed for the rifles, they raced beside the door. about Jesse James and the Youngers. They were related, they were cousins. And um, they were scarred by the Civil War. And then they ran with William Cantrell and Bloody Bill Anderson. And if you've ever read anything about those two outlaws, it's just unbelievable. Bloody Bill Anderson or, and one of them ran wiped out the t uh, town in Kansas. Anyway, um, but they used to, in Northfield, they used to call that the Jesse James days. And somewhere along the line, people are saying, wait a minute, why are we giving Jesse James credit for something that was so awful? And so they changed it to the defeat of Jesse James. And this man here, Joseph Hayward, was the hero of the town. Now, Jesse James and his gang, when they would go into town, they had a pattern. A couple of them would rush into town and shoot everything up and bang, you know, and just race around town 
which would make all the people flee and hide. And then they'd scoop up the money and take off. Well, Fairfield, Minnesota didn't do that. They stood their ground. And <coughs> Fairfield was not their first choice. They had another town staked out, but people were just acting like they understood what was going on. And so they were suspicious of these fancy horses and these guys coming in in fancy clothes. So they went, they didn't take that town. They went out, got drunk that night, and they went into Fairfield, and their rhythm and everything was off. And so the, Mr. Hayward was the substitute cashier that day. It was 1876. The owners of the bank were at a celebration on the East Coast in Philadelphia, Boston, or wherever they were. And Mr. Hayward was the treasurer at the college there and the treasurer of the city. And when they came in, well, when he, the, they asked him, do you think he had, there was a robbery? Do you think anyone, would you give it to him? And he said, no, I think not. Well. The vault, the, when they came in, the vault was closed, but it was not locked. And uh, they asked him to open it up, and he wouldn't. They could have opened it, but they were so off their task that they took the change that was in a box and ran out of town, and they ended up dropping it. But anyway, so, uh, and so they dedicate the defeat of Jesse James to this man, because there was no FDIC at that time. The town would have been ruined financially. And then a young immigrant crossing the road didn't speak the language, didn't understand what was going on, and they killed him. He, they shot him, and he died a couple of minutes, a couple of days later. They shot him too. Oh, yes, they shot him. Yeah. Frank, and Frank shot him, which was unusual. Usually Jesse was the one that was shooting. So Mr. Hayward passed away, he died, and the city um, put his daughter through college. So anyway, it's a defeat of Jesse James. And um, now, that is such a sad, sad story. We don't want to end this show on such a sad, sad note. Now, most everything we've done today is um, been about a complicated trail. Now, we're going to send you out and on a happy note. Now, you've noticed that the words have always been up there. Well, if Terry, do you mind if they sing along? The words, you'll know the songs coming up. And yes, <laughs> just jump right in. Okay, now. just one more minute. I've got the microphone. Anyway, <laughs> I kept coming across this picture when I was doing Jesse, looking for Jesse James stuff. And these are the younger brothers. They went to jail. And um, I couldn't figure out what is this woman doing and why are they in suits? <laughs> to find out, the Stillwater prison would take pictures of the youngers and then sell them and generate some money that way. <laughs> this is their sister. She came up and shortly after um, she, they, this picture was taken, um, Bob died of tuberculosis the one over on the far side. And uh, it's my understanding, Jim in the middle there committed suicide after he was released. And Cole lived a long life. And he despised Jesse James. And there's reasons why. And because um, Jesse was always just sporadic. And he didn't have any conscience. But anyway, so uh, that's the story I'm there. I think I've been talking for now. <laughs> and then uh, we're going to end this on a cheerful note. And I'm going to let Terry talk this through. I'll okay. I, I dug up all this stuff. I've been doing these songs for years and years. And you, I know you know them too. And we're going to end it with I'm an Old Cow Hand. And it was done by... Go ahead, read it, Marcy. Mean Crush. Yeah. Alright. And then the next we have uh, of course Jean Audrey, South of the Border. And then we have one more here. And this is the Sons of the Pioneers. Now you know that Festus, who was on Gunsmoke, was part of 
uh, the Sons of the Pioneers for a while. So he's, Marcy put her little red arrow up there for him. So we're going to start with, uh, I'm an old cow hand. We'll do them in that order. I'm an old cow hand from the Rio Grande. And my legs ain't bold and my cheeks ain't tan. I'm a cowboy who never saw a cow, never rode the steer cause they don't know how. Sure ain't fixing to start it now. Yippee I oh kaye, yippee I oh kaye. I'm an old cow hand from the Rio Grande, and I learned to ride before I learned to stand. I'm a riding fool who is up to date. I know every trail. Star State. I ride the range in my Ford V8. Yippee I O K I E. Yippee I O K I E. As I was walking one morning for pleasure, I spied a cow puncher riding along. His hat was thrown back. His spurs were jingling as he approached. He was singing this song: "Whoopie tie, I own. Get along, little ogies. It's your misfortune and none of my own. Whoopie tie, I own. Get along, little ogies. You know that why woman will be your new home. It's early." Spring when we round up the toys, we rope them and brand them and bob off their tails. Round up the horses, load up the chuck wagon, and send those old donkeys down on the north trail. We'll be tired. Smiles. We ride to the sunset. 
to our home across the miles. So keep us so warm in your heart, keep your spirits lifted high. I know we'll meet again, but for now we'll say goodbye. We ride to the sunset. Our time here is through.